morning, good morning, good morning. It is good to be found in the house of the Lord this morning, is it not? Amen. I was listening to Jim as he went over the things that we we are not. And I want to reiterate what we are. We are children of God who loves the Lord. And we're learning to represent him here on earth. Scripture tells us that the love of God has been poured forth into us. So when the Spirit of God comes to live inside of us and we are saved, he also comes with the intentions of sanctifying us to set us apart. And we are we're set apart to live for him because he died for us. And part of the forum of living is loving. Matter of fact, it's the foundation. And we're to love as he loved us. We want to be known as a church that has a spirit that emits the love of God. Folks are drawn, as it said in the scripture, they were drawn to Jesus because of the pure love. That was his, his foundation. He came because he loved us. He died because he loved us. God sent him because he loved us. So the very, the, the very essence of who we are is this vivid picture of love. The God kind of love. This morning what I wanted to do was we are going to continue in the book of Acts in chapter 13, but don't turn there yet because I wanted to give you something a little encouragement. Because things get real difficult here on earth. Very difficult. And as you see the occurrences, just when you ask yourself that it can't get any worse, it does. I sometimes sit and wonder how can people do what they do to one another? What has been lost when a father kills his family? What has been lost in the human frame when children kill parents and parents kill children or we kill one another? What goes on in us that cruelty to one another is accepted? You would think if I have the love of God living inside of me, that there would be a conflict. There would be something there to say. We don't do that. You've heard me say before that there, that preachers don't teach enough on heaven. And what it means to us. What's the focus of heaven in our lives? To me is everything. 
It's, it's our hope. It's our foundation. We're passing through on this earth. This is not our home. But sometimes we get fixed in and we respond to life as if it is. Jesus tells us in Matthew that we should not store up treasures for ourselves here on earth, but they're to be stored up in heaven. That's the promise. That's our hope. So I thought this morning I, I, I would begin by just giving you some words. And you know that words have a way of creating pictures in our minds. I've been reading, reading Max Lucado books for the last 25 years. I love his writing because his writings are so picturesque. When you read what Max Lucado have to write, it creates a picture very easily in your brain. And each day I, I have one in my office and I have several at the house and I like to read them. And he has them for all 306 and something days of the year. And this morning, I thought it was so apropos. There is joy in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner who repents. You can read that. And you can just run right by it. You can hear it. And it sounds good. And it is good. But nothing that would make you stop and say, take me deeper. I wanted to share with you this morning a little deeper. What heaven holds. When do Jesus and his angels rejoice over one repenting sinner? Can they see something we don't? Do they know something we don't? Absolutely. They know what heaven holds. Heaven is populated by those who let God change them. Hmm. Roland mentioned about being a new creature in Christ, a new creation, a new heart, a new outlook, a new promise, a new joy. Arguments will cease where jealousy won't exist. Suspicions won't surface for there will be no secrets. Every sin is gone. Every insecurity is forgotten. Every fear is past. Pure wheat, no weeds. Pure gold, no alloys. Pure love, no lust. Pure hope, no fear. No wonder the angels rejoice when one sinner repents. They know another work of art will soon grace the gallery of God. They know what heaven holds, just like Jesus. See, there's a day coming when we're going to see the Lord face to face, face to face. The scripture says when we see him, we're going to be like him. We're going to have these glorified bodies, but all of the troubles All of the weariness that is caused by a sinful world will have passed. And we will be in a place promised that all of this will be gone. But in the interim, the Lord wanted us to be mindful of that. So he sent his son to reconnect the umbilical cord from God to man. And, and to make sure that we were able to operate and have a solid foundation of righteousness, he sent himself in his spirit to live inside of us. So we have his word and his spirit. 
And what I've learned over time is that the word of God and the spirit of God are the agents of change. This is how change happens in the human genome, in the human being. This is how we move from sinners to sinners saved by grace. This is how I move from, from darkness into the light of God. This is how I see when people are doing things to one another, I say, no. That's not what God intended. God intended that we would have this life on this earth and we would have it in abundance. That's what Jesus says, in abundance. First John 3 and 2 says that, I wish above all things that ye prosper as your soul prospers. So not the prosperity gospel, but life in itself that my soul rejoices in the presence of God. My spirit man is perfect because the spirit of God lives inside of me. I have this living hope in me that surpasses all of the troubles that I see. That's what heaven is about. And my hope is just what you see there will encourage you, enlighten you. That's what Paul says that he wish, as he pray, that the eyes of their hearts would be enlightened. When was the last time you thought about heaven? Chances are it's been a while. And the reason why it is because we are taught, and no, not, no, not, no, we aren't taught because we're not taught. It's out of sight and it's out of mind. And we don't want to think about heaven because when we think about heaven, it must mean we're going to die. And we surely don't want to die. We act like everything is here on this earth. It's just the opposite. So I wanted to bring forward the notes on heaven before you this morning so that when you leave, you might be thinking about heaven and how good it's going to be. Amen? Because it's going to be like nothing we have experienced. But the Lord gave us, he gave to us a glimpse of it because he sent himself. He sent his son and his son gave himself for us. That's not a natural thing. That's supernatural. Can I get an amen? So we're going to dive into chapter 13 in the book of Acts. We, we spent some time two weeks ago and we focused on the individuals that the Lord had put in place in chapter 13, the Gentile church is launched. And we made reference to the five women that are referenced in the book of Matthew, the first chapter, genealogy of Jesus, and how those five women each one represented a different arena for which we ourselves exist. Those women represented us, Mary and Rahab and Tamar and Ruth and Bathsheba. And we said the only one of those five we may have invited to our house <laughs> Would, uh, would be Mary. 
But keep in mind sometimes, sometimes people don't want godly people in their homes either. I don't know how many times I have been, folks see me coming in different neighborhoods and when they see me coming, they lock their door and they tell their children, don't say nothing. Yeah, treat me like the police. Isn't it something that when you treat the preacher like the police, isn't it something? And it goes on. So you ask yourself, why? But it happens. So we have these five ladies, and we went over those things those five ladies represented. Mary was virtuous. But Rahab and Tamar and Bathsheba and Ruth, they weren't. Ruth wasn't even a Jew. Ruth was a part of the clan of people that really wasn't great. They didn't get along with the children of Israel. I find it amazing that the Lord came from such a broad spectrum. These five women. But as I said, those five women represent us. So now the Gentile church is about to begin. And again, the Lord has five people. And those five men are broad, a broad spectrum of us. Some well-to-do, some poor. Us. So when we get to this portion of chapter 13, the scripture tells us that these five men, again, there was one that was, the scripture calls him out as being righteous, full of the Holy Spirit, born of us. And number five, was Saul, who if you were a Christian, you wouldn't invite him to your place. And in the middle you had Simeon, called Niger, which means black. Then you had Lucius from Cyrene, which is where Simeon was from. So you ask yourself, why did they call him? Why did Luke think it important to say Simeon called Niger? He could have said Simeon and Lucius, and Lucius both from Cyrene, which is a city in North Africa, on the coast of North Africa. But he called him out. So that you would say, yeah, that's a black man. Hmm. And then there was Manan, who was the brother-in-law of Herod Antipas, who was the one who had John the Baptist's head cut off, beheaded John. And was going to cause some havoc with other disciples. But here was his brother, his stepbrother, his half brother, in the five people that the Lord used to establish and launch the Gentile church. It's amazing God would use those kinds of people, isn't it? But that's good for us, isn't it? Because all of us are broken, aren't we? Let me say it again. All of us are broken, aren't we? Without God, we but filthy rags. Without, look at, without Jesus Christ, 
we would not have access to a holy God. For which I find is amazing. Because in the Old Testament, people who wouldn't abide by the law, God got rid of them. And here we are, the same flesh and blood, and now God lives inside of us. If you want to know the power of grace, if you want to know the power of what Jesus Christ brings, that in itself speaks volumes. He now lives inside of us. And he's always speaking to us if we seek him with our whole heart. I've spoken to you all time and time again concerning praying and asking the Spirit of God for revelation knowledge of the scriptures. And revelation knowledge of the scripture says, take me beyond what I see, what my eyes see. Because I know so little, and, and you know, I've read the scripture, and yet there's some things I know, but there's so much I don't know. So Holy Spirit, carry me beyond the brazen altar. Bring me into the holy place with you. Help me to see through your eyes. Help me to hear through your ears. Help me to perceive so that in you speaking to me, I will know what it is you're saying to me. And I won't be just religious. I won't just quote the scripture to use it as an anvil or, or you know, something to hurt somebody with, something to, you know, to, 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 to use to say, I'm not and you're not. No. Give it to me so I'll see the application, the very application of the scripture in my life. That I know that I'm broken without him. I'm broken without him. And religion is not going to get me to heaven. So I can get off the tradition of just jumping on the train of religion and that's going to suffice. No, it will not. I've told you before, when Jesus comes, there's going to be a lot of people that's going to be left in the pews. Not only that, there are going to be a lot of preachers that's going to be left in the pulpit. Can't get amen. Now, preachers don't want to tell you that, but let me just call it what it is. So these five men that represent us, the scripture says they were fasting and they were praying. You hear people say now, fasting is a lost art. Well, it was never an art. <laughs> fasting was an act. It was an act of submission. It was an act of one initiated in himself that he needed more than himself. He needed God. And he needed God so bad that he was willing to give up something that was so imperative, food, to find God. See, let me tell you, let me tell you God responds to that. He responds to that. He says, you are looking in Jeremiah, you will find me when you seek after me with your whole heart. See, because if you want to break strongholds in your life, if you really want to know the direction God wants you to do, you know what you got to do. You got to humble yourself and you got to be willing to give up something to get something. Are you with me this morning, church? The, the, the Bible says that, that, that those three men, Simeon, Lucius, and Menaean, the Spirit of God spoke to them and said, lay hands upon these two, and they did. When you lay hands upon people, you're authorizing through the power of God that is in you, that you're standing behind them and you've heard and you're okay. You are convinced. That you now lay your hands upon this individual and pray for them and say, okay, I 
I now acknowledge that God is doing something in your life and I am committing myself to pray for you. That's what they did. They're laying on their hands. Release them to go and do what the Lord has called them to do. So let's get a little deeper. Can we go a little deeper? The birth of the bride. That's us. You've heard me say time and time again, the Lord's going to come back and he's not taking these pews. He's not taking the organ. He's not taking the mortar, the fans. He's coming for us because we are the bride of Christ. We are. We have the Spirit of God living inside of us. This is why Paul declared in 1 Corinthians 3 16, know ye not. And I love I love the way he starts it off when he says, Don't you know? When I hear that phrase, it's like someone saying, Don't you know that you have to eat to live? Don't you know that you're going to have water because if not, you're going to get dehydrated? Don't you know that you have to breathe air so that you will live? Don't you know this? So Paul is emphatic when he says, do you not know that your body is a temple of God and the spirit of God dwells within you? And you are not your own. You were purchased with a price. And the price was Jesus stepping out of eternity into time, submitting himself to what he created. And he died for me that I would live for him. Are you living for him? Are you living for him? This is why it was important to follow up what Jim says to make, to make sure we understand. Because sometimes we can focus on what we're not, but not get the idea of who we are. This is who I am. I live for him. I'm not my own anymore. And because the Holy Spirit is a gentleman, because he will not come and usurp your authority, your will to do what it is you want to do, but he will put it in your, look at, he will put it in your place so that you can see it and go, this is the way you should be living. And he may do that with a preacher. He may do it with a teacher. He may do it with your children. He may do it with the people on your job, but you know what? He's going to get it to you. And he'll get it to you a couple of times. And if, but if you ignore it, he will stop saying anything at all. And you've heard me say, that stealing is a sin, lying is a sin, cheating is a sin, all of those things are sins. But there's a sin that I believe to be greatest of all. It is the sin that we ignore the spirit of God and who he is. He is God. And you cannot be changed without him. He is the one that comes in and brings the new. Look here. He. He does the metamorphosis that goes on. The things I used to do, I don't do anymore. The places I used to go, I don't go anymore. He is the one that changes me. Because if I try to change myself, if I would, I wish I could, I could, I could, I could, could. I could go through that affirmation process for a while, but you know what? It will not last. <laughs> Look here, I did good on the diet and I lost that weight. And I kept saying to myself, 
I am not going to eat that bad stuff that I know I shouldn't be eating. The stuff I stopped eating caused me to lose the weight. Guess what? <laughs> Didn't last at all. Miss Linda brought home some of those, uh, what are those, uh, croissant buns, them things? A whole, a whole deal of them. You hear them telling you? I mean a whole container of them. And I said, I'm just going to have one. <laughs> and then something in my brain said, but have another one. And by the end of last night, when I got finished watching all that football and all the other stuff I was doing, there was one left. There were probably 15 in there. And when she came in and said, okay, you want your supper? I tried to justify it and say, no, no, I've, no, I've eaten a lot. No, I, I don't eat. It's filled with bread. <laughs> we need more. We need more. And the Lord knew that. And that's why he sent his spirit to empower us. That's why it says, hey, look here, empowerment of the Holy Spirit. It empowers me to change. I can't change on my own. Even when I know what is right without his power. That's why Paul said what he says when he says, oh, wretched man I am. Do everything I don't want to do. I do. And the things I shouldn't do are the things I should do, I don't do. We are in need of him. The world. You know, we hear him saying that the world's in trouble. When has the world, when have the world ever not been in trouble. Always. Ain't nothing new. Yeah. Saul and Barnabas sent as missionaries. Acts chapter 13, verses 4 through 12. Actually, it should be verses 4 through 13. Because I included the very last verse over there. Verse 13 is when John Mark leaves them. And we want to cover it because it causes a great upheaval in the mission of God. It caused upheaval in the men, not in God's plan. And what I want us to understand is that when man fails, it does not mean God has failed. Can I get amen? Talk to me now. When man fails, by no means does it mean that God can't get done what he wants to get done. Amen? Amen? And that encourages me. Scripture says, weeping is at night, but joy coming in the morning. Trouble don't last always. Oh, yeah. The two of them sent on their way by the Holy Spirit went down to Cilicia and sailed from there to Cyprus. When they arrived at Salamis, they proclaimed the word of God in the Jewish synagogues. John was with them as their helper, and that's John Mark. They traveled through the whole island until they came to Paphos. There they met a Jewish sorcerer a false prophet named Bar-Jesus, who was an attendant of the proconsul Sergius Paulus. Now, do you remember back when we were doing the walk through the New Testament, we talked about the proconsul and the pro those two? 
Those were like governors. Those were appointed by the council. And one versus the other, one, the procurator, was one who, when it was a troublesome place, that's who was appointed to man that particular city. And he had a lot of the Roman armies there too as they were working to get things in order. When there was a place that Roman has conquered and it's somewhat serene and it's, you know, it's, 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 it's about the Roman way of living and, and people are doing what they're supposed to do, they would appoint a proconsul. All righty? So this gentleman that was there, he had the, he had access to Bar Jesus, the sorcerer. See, back then it was important. People wanted to know what was going on. And they wanted people who can tell, interpret dreams and things like that. So, so, so this sorcerer had access to this proconsul. All righty? You with me? The proconsul, an intelligent man, sent for Barnabas and Saul because he wanted to hear the word of God. I want you to think about that for a moment. This man has been appointed by the highest court in Rome to head up this particular region. And this man has made a decision that he wants to hear from Barnabas and Saul the word of God. It's amazing, isn't it? Come on, I expand your horizon. This is not just some citizen. This is the leader from Rome. And he wants to hear from Saul and Barnabas about Jesus. But Elamas, the sorcerer, for that is what his name means, opposed them and tried to turn the proconsul from the faith. Hmm. Then Saul. Well, let me ask you something. Why do you think he wanted to turn the proconsul from the faith? Why did he not want Barnabas and Saul to have access to the governor? He would lose his job. You've heard me speak about not that money is evil, but the love of money is evil. You remember when they turned against Jesus because their positions were in jeopardy. When they turned against Stephen because their positions always, always into their mind, power and money. And it still goes on today. You've heard me made reference to the fact that we're off the assembly line of humanity. So what they were going through back then, we're going through now. The setting is different. The toys are different. The verbiage is different. But the hearts are the same. Isn't that something? Yeah. Entirely different. Then Saul, who was called Paul, filled with the Holy Spirit, looked straight at Elymas and said, you are a child of the devil, an enemy of everything that is right. And that's what we've been talking about this morning, doing what's right. When people have gotten off to where they do whatever it is they want to do, contrary to just the respect of life. Just the respect 
of the law of this country. Being in America, freedom. But you've heard me say many times before, and I can't say enough, freedom without discipline is impending bondage. You got your freedom, and you exercising your freedom, and you do it without some kind of discipline, eventually, you're going to fall to it. And that's exactly where we are in the struggle we're in right now in America. I can do what I want to do. Really? Really? No, you can't. So Paul looks at this guy. <laughs> and Paul, Paul calls him the devil. And remember, Lucifer, when he was in heaven, was referred to as the light. When he got kicked out, knocked down here, he called Satan, which is dark. You are filled in all kinds of deceit and trickery. Will you never stop perverting the right ways of the Lord. Wow. Wow. There was a time I was foolish when I was young. But as I got older and became a man, I had to put that foolishness to the side. I think there's a scripture that speaks about that. Right? What does that scripture say? Huh? Yeah, when I was a child, I acted like a child. I did childish things. I had childish thoughts. I thought if I wanted to go and take somebody's candy, I can go take it because I was big and bad enough. When I would go to the Lake County Jail, I would walk in and I would tell them, you all a bunch of babies. And they would look at me with that look. Well, I was big enough that I wasn't afraid of them. And if they had done me anything, they got more time in solitary confinement. So I had both things working for me. But I would say to them, you're like babies. And the reason why I would say that to them, because you go around trying to take people's things that don't belong to you. That's what children do. You got to grow up. Their laws, their rules and regulations say you can't do that. That's exactly what the Lord is saying to us. Well, we're not taking people's candy, but we're passing judgment on them. We're deeming them not to be the people of God. Well, who, wait, wait a minute, how can you? Hold on a minute. Don't you know God grace, God's grace cover good and bad? Like the scripture says the sun rise and it on the good and the bad. Doesn't that? Of course it does. Now the hand of the Lord against you. The hand of the Lord is against you. This is what Paul told him. You are going to be blind for it. I thought this was absolutely amazing. That saw blind a man. Do y'all know where I'm going? <laughs> Isn't that something? Saul was blinded. So Saul blind the man. I thought, Isn't that something? Way to go, Saul. <laughs> he put the man in darkness because he himself had been in darkness. You're going to be blind for a time, not even able to see the light of the sun. Immediately, mists and darkness came over him, and he groped around, groped around, seeking someone to lead him by the hand. When the proconsul saw what had happened, he believed, but he was amazed at the teaching about the Lord from Papos, Paul, and his companions sailed to Perga and Pamphylia where 
John left them to return to Jerusalem. Okay. That's verses 12 through 13. I would go further, but I think I want to wait until next week. And I'll show you where we are. I showed you this map. The reason why I showed you this map is because I wanted you to better grasp what was going on with Saul and Barnabas. You see Antioch at the very and Zilicia, Zilicia at the top. And you see that that's the island of Cyprus. And there are three areas there, Papos and there where they were. And they, that was their first mission. There's a lot going on there. Cyprus was the third largest island in the Mediterranean, but born, and it was Barnabas' home. It had two main cities, Salamis, the commercial center of the eastern side, and Papos, the political center on the western side. Barnabas and Saul arrived there first in Salamis and preached the word of God in the synagogues of the Jews. As, the Jewish, as a Jewish scholar, Paul was permitted to speak to those who knew the scriptures, a perfect way to begin a ministry in a new area. Now, from when Paul was converted, to baptized, for which he went to the desert for three years, he was gone an equivalent of nine years, before he and Barnabas got back together. There's a lot that has happened. And the Lord has worked in and through Saul. And we're going to see his name changed from Saul to Paul. Now, what we're going to see is that back in those days, because of their interactions, Everyone had really two names. There was a name for which they dealt in Hebrew, in Jews, and there's a name associated with Greek and the Gentiles. And Paul, you know how you have the names and you say, this is what this name represents? Well, Paul represents small. And I'm amazed at it. And the reason why I'm amazed at it because the Lord dots every I and cross every T. And the fact that he was going to use one that was so truculent, one that was so adamant, one that was so stringent as Saul was. He's got a new name now, and he's going to the Gentiles, and his names mean small. There's a scripture in the Old Testament, and it speaks about Saul, who was the king that was dethroned for David to become king. And the Lord sends Saul a message. And he tells him, tell Saul, he was good in my eyes when he was small. But now that he's got to be so big, he can no longer serve in the kingdom. See, the scripture says that the Lord gives grace to the humble. And that he who humbles himself will be exalted. One of the things I learned about the Lord, because I was, I was cocky in my time. Yes, I was. My physical prowess literally said to me, I can do anything I wanted to do. I was semi-intelligent. Mm-hmm. 
But the Lord said, take all of that away. And I'm going to tell you something. You don't want to shadow box with the Lord. Because what the Lord want out of you, he will get it. Are you, are you hearing what I'm saying? What he wants out of you, he will get it. I look at, I understood that when the Lord said to me it was time that he was willing to put me, my whole body below the ground then nothing would be open but my nostrils to get air in my body so I wouldn't die. But he was able, you hear about, I told you all about, you know, how Saul spoke to the man and he's gotten darkness and Saul was in darkness. Let me tell you something. The Lord is still doing that. Oh, he's not taking one sight. But I'm going to tell you something. He will put you in a situation. Yes, he will. He will put you in a situation where it's only going to be him and you. And you got a choice to make. Are you hearing me? For a long time, I told people I ran from the Lord. Because I told the Lord I didn't want to preach. Who knew? Who? Oh, no. Mm -mm. Nope. I was a finance manager in a, in a big company like Martin Marietta making a bunch of money. I lived in a two-story house with a big old pool and a nice car and a nice neighborhood. I remember what it was like to be poor because I was raised very, very poor. And I figured being a preacher, that's exactly where I was going back to. And I'm going, uh-uh. No, absolutely not. Well, you know what the Lord, in the fullness of time? Oh, yeah. Yeah. And once I said yes to him, and boy, he began to work on me. Let me tell you something. There was a lot he had to take out of me, and he's still taking it out of me. But I was good saying that I ran from the Lord until one day he said to me, boy, you ran for me but I ran with you. I wouldn't let the devil have his way with you. What is all, what does all of this mean? It means that your lifespan have assigned to it God's purpose. There's a purpose for you being on the earth at this time. There's a purpose for you being where you are. And it's God's purpose. If you have given your life to Christ, you now, your existence is about God's purpose. Do you understand? It's about God's purpose. And you know what he wants of us? He wants us to finish on purpose. He wants us to finish on purpose. Where are you? Are you avoiding him? Are you running from him? Have you made a decision that this is enough? You're giving him all what was expected? I would say to you, go back to the drawing board. Go back to your closet and call upon him and say, Lord, are you pleased with my life? Are you pleased with me? And allow the spirit of God to minister to you. It's, it's like it, it is very important that we finish on purpose. That I purposely am focusing on doing what the Lord has called me to do. And the other aspect is, is that I finish on purpose exactly what he wanted me to do. I don't know if Adams or Baptist Church will be my last stop in preaching. I don't know. Maybe next month he sends me to October somewhere. But here's what I do know. My intent is this. To finish well. And wherever it is he would have me to go, go. Because where he guides, he provides. 
therein we call him Jehovah Jireh, our provider. Church, we're going to get a little bit deeper in it. Lot to share with you, man, because, you know, we're going to see a lot of us in John Mark. John made a decision. And we got a lot of questions we're going to ask. Why did John do that? And a lot of those questions are going to align with what goes on in our brain. And the reason why? We are decision makers. But when we make those decisions contrary to God, we get outside of that perfect will. I don't want to be in his permissive will. I want to be in his perfect will. Can I get an amen? Bow your heads and let's close with a word of prayer. Father in heaven, I cannot thank you enough because without you, I'm nothing. Without you, I can't do this. Father, we invite you to be here, not only to live inside of us, but to manifest among us. That we be mindful that our steps are ordered in your word, and your word is a lamp to our feet and a light to the path. Help us, for we are always in need of your help. Always. There's not a day, there's not a second that go by that we can function without you. We dare not. So we pray that your glorious and wonderful hand will be upon Adams of Baptist Church and that you would bless us indeed that you will increase our borders of righteousness and keep us from sin so that we will not cause pain. Father, you did it for Jabez. Do it for us. Make it plain to us, Father God. Expand our borders. Help us, Father God, to touch the lost in this world. Help us to touch the hurting in this world. Help us to touch the hungry in this world. Help us to be a people of purpose and power and praise one that is focused on pleasing you. We love you, Father God. In Jesus' glorious and wonderful name we pray. And all said together, amen. God bless you, saints, and I'll see you Tuesday, Wednesday, Friday, Saturday, or Sunday. <laughs>